Hi, welcome to the 56th Chicago International Film Festival. My name is Anthony Kaufman. I'm a senior programmer here at the festival. Thank you very much for tuning into our Q&A of Till Kingdom Come, directed by Maya Zinstein. We're very excited to have with us the director, uh, all the way from Israel, Maya Zinstein, producer, Abby Troen, and one of the subjects of the film, Yal Ekstein, the president of the International Alliance of Christians and Jews. If you saw the film, uh, you will know exactly who she is. Uh, thanks very much for uh, being with us, everyone. Um, you're all in Israel. Um, I hope everything is uh, is well there. Um, here in Chicago, it's getting colder, which is unfortunate. Um, so if people have questions uh, for any of uh, 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 the folks here, you can insert those questions and we'll try and weave them into the discussion. So feel free to uh, um, uh, ask your questions and we'll, we'll get to them at some point. So. Let's let's talk uh, about the film. Um, uh, Maya, it's nice to see you again. You were here at the festival a few years ago with your film uh, Forever Pure. Um, and yeah, we're excited to have the international premiere of Till Kingdom Come. So um, what's so fascinating about the film, there's such a complexity to the issues involved here. And I thought we should we should really kick off and address the the main it's kind of the main one of the main questions of the film. And I saw just today Pat Robertson declared that Trump was going to win the election and and part of that um, uh, win was going to be a kind of end times prophecy. Um, and that was gonna, we were going to see the, the end of Israel um, and some of the things that the, the film discusses. And I, I guess I wanted to address this question then for you, Maya, first of all, how you thought of that, that um, dichotomy, let's say, uh, that paradox, as Yael says in the film, um, and then Yael, how you sort of deal with that paradox or the elephant in the room, as you say, of, of you know, the Christian group supporting Israel, and yet at the same time, there's this apocalyptic prophecy that obviously doesn't doesn't bode well for um, Jewish people. So, Maya? So thank you very much, Anthony. It's really great to be again in the Chicago Film Festival. I wish I could be in Chicago. I love this city. Uh, but I hope with my next film uh, to actually be able to, to, to go back. Um, so you decided to start uh, from the elephant <laughs> in the room, which is always uh, good to start from the big, from the big issues. Um, I think, you know, when, when I started the, the research uh, for this film, of course, this question is kind of raises, this is one of the first things that you read about once you start to, to kind of explore in this this topic and and you know and yes the, the, the prophecy is not really great for us uh, basically for those who are not uh, really familiar with that um, so it would say that uh, at the end of times when uh, uh, Jesus returns so uh, two thirds of the Jews will uh, die and one third will convert but for me to be honest what were much more concerning is not only the end of this uh, process, but also uh, the way that we're having towards the end. Uh, because, you know, you know, I'm, I'm a secular person, so um, I really, to be honest, uh, don't really care if people think that I'm going to hell, even though that's like not really nice feeling. Uh, but, but the thing for me, as, as an is especially as an Israeli, the biggest question was, what actually they think should happen to us before the end. Um, and, and, and there, you know, you go to these big questions about, and, and I think that the pastors in the film, and it was a huge goal for me to actually, that this issue won't be addressed by, you know, some um, professed the theological professor or something like that. But actually been told by pastors that there's a huge congregations behind them. Um, and, and basically, the, what is concerns me the most is the fact that in their, in their faith, uh, there is a, a big um, part that uh, says that, you know, there will be a big trouble in Israel, a tribulation, how they call it. And, and then it, it raises a question for myself again as an Israeli, um, how we are cooperating in actually um, working with people and letting them influence our uh, present and future uh, 
and how we do it with people that also believe that that violence is, is part of the prophecy and and to be and that's what concerns me the most you know my i have a brother that will go that in the in the reserve forces of the idf in a special unit the next war he will going to fight it just as if fought the previous ones and, and i have you know very personal concerns about in the name of whom is going to fight these wars and 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 for me that was probably the most disturbing question probably even bigger than you know, what happened to us as jews at the end which again of course it's it's not fun to hear that i'm just going to remind you guys when you're not talking if uh you can mute your mic so we can avoid the uh the feedback so if you just hit the mute button uh, so yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, I love it how Maya loves her brother so much. I've heard him quoted so many times, and and he sounds amazing. Um, and I think it's an amazing film that Maya and AB produced with really open eyes to explore this issue. I spent a lot of time with both of them, um, and saw how how they really connected emotionally with an open mind and open heart to really understand the issue. So um, I think it's an amazing process, and I think it's a really important film. Um, Listen, I think it's really hard to sum up um, hundreds of millions of evangelicals into one um, in, into one frame with one intention. So from my experience over the past 15 years working with evangelical Christians very closely is that um, yes, there is the end of time scenario. Um, a lot of them are actually based on Jewish prophecy that in, Ju in Judaism, we look at the prophets and believe in uh, a war of Gog Magog, and we say, um, that God's name will be completed and uh, put into one and that the whole world will kind of have this visualization and realization of God. Um, and, and so the Christians take it differently. Obviously, they believe in Jesus and believe that Jesus will return and that the Jews will see the light. Um, but from my experience, there are, there are two things. Number one, like Maya said, that the fact that they think I'm going to hell if I don't accept Jesus is what we always say is we'll see what happens when Messiah comes. Um, the fact of uh, Christians being involved right now politically with Israel is something that I very much understand that it's an important question to raise and explore of who is creating and influencing Israel's foreign policy. And just like Maya's brother is in special um, units that he's gonna go out to fight if there's a next war. Um, I'm raising four children here who are also all four of them gonna go to the army and have to fight any wars. That my biggest blessing, um, my biggest prayer would be for the blessing of peace to come to fruition. And so um, I definitely, uh, understand this thought and appreciate this thought. And I think there are so many different players who are involved in creating and influencing um, Israel foreign policy towards Israel, both on the right and on the left with different objectives. And my experience with Christians personally is that, um, that they take the lead based on what Israel and Israel's government specifically wants. So for example, there was the ability to push for annexation of Judea and Samaria just recently. Um, and my good friend and someone who was in uh, the film also, Johnny Moore, he was working specifically on a peace agreement with the UAE that Christians were not only um, hoping and trying to influence Israel to accept a peace agreement with Arab countries instead of the annexation of Judea and Samaria, but actually creating that policy. Same thing goes when um, Jews were, excel were expelled from the Gaza Strip. The Christians didn't stop supporting or loving Israel because that didn't go with their biblical narrative. So I think that that there's basically two different things happening right now. From my experience is one, um, the, the ideal, that is people of faith, people who uh, believe in the words of the Bible, believe it to be true. And that's kind of the common bond between the Jews and Christians that we both believe in the wor words of the Torah, the Old Testament that um, there is kind of an ideal of what will happen, what will be. But then there's also the reality. And from my experience, um, I have never seen Christians push for something uh, as regarding foreign policy in America that the government of Israel and the majority of people did not want. So maybe a, a follow-up question to all of you. The, the, I think the film makes a fairly persuasive case that, that, um, that the the current policies um, towards Israel are 
let's say, uh, not uh, not not beneficial for peace, but but are stirring up more conflicts, perhaps. And I'm wondering, Abby, uh, you know, we haven't heard from you as, as the producer of the film. Um, you know, if you wanted to chime in as well. And I'm wondering if you feel like um, that that this is this is a a, a complication um, that's making things more challenging um, because of uh, uh, evangelicals. Uh, Advocation, adv you know, advocacy, advocacy efforts in Israel. Um, well, I think the the way to, to look at it. Uh, hold on, there, there's. Oh, sorry, Yale. Yeah, can you? Reason. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I think you you know the film points out several instances where. American foreign policy impacts the lives of Israelis and Palestinians and people in the region, right? You have the US embassy move, you have at the end the Trump peace plan with a plan for annexation. And even if you look today, today a peace plan was signed with the Emirates just this morning. Uh, I think the underlying message is that these events actually mean something quite different if you are an evangelical, if you are an Israeli, and if you are a Palestinian. In other words, the U.S. embassy move is an example for an event where uh, if you're an Israeli, you think, wonderful, we're getting, you know, something we've been hoping for for a long time. And, and this is um, uh, a statement that Trump is on our side. If you're an evangelical, actually, you're seeing it as a domestic issue for you. You're saying, I'm a constituent. The Obama administration forgot me. And here I have this guy, Donald Trump, who's going to stand and, and signal to me that he sees me. However, if you're a Palestinian, that's a slap in the face saying that the two-state solution is no longer on the table as it has been before then. And the way it was done was such a way that the Palestinians were excluded from the picture. So just breaking down that one example, and if you're looking towards peace, shows how this relationship, in essence, as the Israeli foreign correspondent says, um, you know, down to the, to the Trump peace plan, had an uh, evangelical pastor, I think he said, a Jewish bride, but you know, no, no Palestinians at that event. Um, and I think, you know, each viewer will be able to interpret and understand that um, in their own eyes. I will also add, j just going off of that, that you know, the elections are taking place in two weeks, right? But the Israeli-Palestinian, yeah, right, and, and the American election, um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is going to go on, looking forward past the 2020 elections, 2024, hopefully there will be peace, but it is not likely. Um, and that I think the issue of how Israel plays in Israel and the Palestinians play into American domestic politics is crucial in a way that many Israelis and Palestinians are not aware of until watching a film like this, where they understand that we're factoring in into some issue that, that uh, is very important to people in places like Kentucky. Anyone want to add? I want to, I, I want to add some, something additional. There's another event in the in political event in the film that we are uh, showing, which basically shows how uh, um, uh, the, the event of Christians United for Israel uh, basically going and sending their people to uh, go and lobby against um, the American aid for uh, Palestinians, and that's something. Just as an example, you know, that idea, that idea was the security uh, community in you know, in Israel was really against it because the security community in Israel understands that the last thing that Israel needs is a humanitarian crisis on their border. So then you're standing there and you're saying, "Wait a minute!" So you have Christian evangelicals pushing an agenda that the security community in Israel is saying, no, we don't need it, we don't want this. And then in the film, you literally see action, reaction. You see how these 5,000 Christian evangelicals go into the Capitol Hill. First, they've been taught how to speak against, uh, uh, how to, what to say, and then they basically sent to the Capitol Hill. And a month later, 
Trump is cutting the cutting the aid. And that's a great example that and it's really funny because a half year later, Benjamin Netanyahu, our prime minister, actually asked Trump to give this aid back because again, all the security community here understand that this is really, really bad. And 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 and, and Trump said no. I cut it and like it's a done deal. So that's a great example. And, and, and it also refers to what Yael says that basically the evangelicals are doing what Israel is, is asking them to do. And I think the Christian evangelicals are following a very specific right wing policy and supporting it. And that's not the whole Israel. There's many opinions here. There's also people that believe that, you know, that that we should not uh, hold the West Bank and, and et cetera, et cetera. So yes, I do think when we're talking about support, you know, support is a, it's not an objective term. It's a subjective term because I do think that these uh, policies that uh, Christian evangelicals are trying to promote, uh, many Israelis will not agree with them and they won't see it as a support. They will see it actually as a very disturbing intervention into our internal issues with the the Palestinians that live in our borders. We don't have to get into a debate, but Yael, do you, did you want to respond or I can move on to another question? Um, I'll, I'll say something quickly. I, th I think in any democracy, Israel's a democracy, and you have right wing and you have left wing, that no matter what people are going to want on one side and foreign policy, we're also interconnected these days. So just like there are people on the other side that our donors wouldn't agree with who are trying to make their influence on Capitol Hill, sometimes with more success, sometimes with less success, that we're, that many of our donors weren't happy with the influence on Capitol Hill from the other side that was against what they believe. That, that's what happens in a democracy, that sometimes you are happy. Everyone's always trying to push their agenda. Sometimes you're happy with it, sometimes you're not. And right now we have two right-wing governments that this is just kind of the influence that um, we've seen, whether connected to policy, like Maya said, whether connected to religious beliefs, what, whatever it's uh, the source is. I mean, it's not only evangelicals, it's all, it, we live in a very politically heated time. The last thing that I would want to point out, though, um, is that the fellowship, actually, the organization, that I represent, we are not directly involved in politics at all. So um, first of all, we don't have programs specifically for Judea and Samaria. We are the largest funders of non-Jews in Israel, Arabs, Bedouins, Druze. In the past 10 years, we've donated over $20 million to those communities. Um, this year, we have programs over $2.5 million specifically for Arab, Bedouin, Druze, Christians in Israel. Um, and so we go, we work according to criteria and we're a humanitarian organization. We don't distribute our aid according to religion or location. And so um, while our donors might and are feel very passionately about Israel and, and that sometimes represents itself in uh, political support for Israel also, which I personally, you know, have my own opinions on. I think it's a good thing. But the fellowship um, in no way, in no way, in no way pushes. We've never told our donors who to vote for. We always get, for example, around the, especially now in this politically heated time, we get a letter saying, who should we vote for? Who will be better for Israel? And we don't answer that. No one knows, not my staff, not my donors, who I personally vote for. That um, while support for Israel in and of itself could be viewed as a very political statement, uh, we keep it humanitarian and we keep it very um, professionally distributed, that humanitarian aid according to criteria and not location or religion. So I'm, you know, you guys are obviously very different people. Um, Maya, admitted to being secular person. Um, I'm curious as to how the, the relationship between the two of you developed to make this film and to give the access, uh, Yael, that Maya has to you. So I, I feel like, you know, there's obviously, yeah, you're coming from different perspectives um, and yet, um, you know, you're talking to each other. So how, how did that, uh, how did that initial discussion happen, Maya? And how did how did, how did the continuing discussions happen? Because some of those conversations in the film strike me as a tad uncomfortable. So yeah, I will start, but please feel uh, free to jump in whenever you feel uh, that it's that it's the time. <laughs> so actually, I started the the conversation with the Rabbi Kiel Ekstein, Zal Yael's dad. 
Um, it was very, now I, I started the research and, and as a research, you just kind of mapping all the players uh, that you have within this bond. And of course the fellowship is, is a major player, uh, probably the biggest one here in Israel. Um, so yeah, so I just asked to meet uh, Rabbi Axin and I have to say that he was this kind of person that uh, even if you don't agree with him, like in two minutes, he, he just gets you. <laughs> um, and and it, was, it was a wonderful meeting and, and I wasn't sure if it, yeah, if where it will go. Um, but then it just, we, we can, AB and I decided to, to go and, and start our research actually on the ground in the United States. And the fellowship uh, had this uh, huge uh, annual event in Mar-a-Lago uh, in Trump's home, uh, which uh, never made it into the film. It's like the things that you film and, and, and dine on the, in the edit room. Um, and and Ellen and I met, and it was and, and there started this conversation. It was really interesting because I was constantly going to kind of to Rabbi Axton because he was you know he's the person that that established it, and he was constantly telling me no 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 you should go to Yael, and and he you know and it's you know I have goosebumps when I'm thinking about this every time it's like almost he knew, uh, you know that he won't be there. Uh, um, to kind of to finish with us uh, this film. Um, so this relationship kind of evolved and, and, and at some point I thought that it actually can be really interesting also because we had these conversations with the Ellen, it was very clear uh, that she's a young woman and I always uh, would happy to have uh, young woman uh, characters. <laughs> That's always good. Um, and and, and it, it was very clear for me that there's also this angle of kind of the legacy that you're having from your father and you've taken it forward. And, and AB and I, we saw this uh, very interesting comparison that we can create between her and Pastor Boyd. So, so at some point it almost um, naturally, you know, moved and, 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 and concentrated on Yael. Um, and Yael, you want to continue? Because I feel that you need to participate in this conversation as well. <laughs> Well, I do lots of interviews, but I'm also very protective a little bit of my of my personal life and, and of I am very committed to the organization and not, you know, so much to brand awareness or things like that. Um, and so I remember the first time I met Maya and AB were at a hotel in Florida and Maya missed her flight and was running really late and AB showed up and was begging me and my father to stay. And my father kept saying, just interview Yael, just interview Yael. Um, and it was just a regular interview. If, I if she would have told me then, Yael, we're following you for the next two and a half years through the most emotional and crazy time of your life, I would have said, no way. But she's very, very smart, this Maya Zenstein. And <laughs> after the interview, she's just like, oh, you spoke about this. Could we just come see it? Oh, sure. Before I know it, they're following me everywhere I go, and we are in some of the most ridiculous situations in the world together. And um, and I simply fell in love with both of them, and, and loved having them follow me around. And and I really developed this trust and appreciation um, for what they were doing, even though I didn't really know what it was. But I felt like it was something important that, even if I didn't fully agree with, was an important message to get out. Uh, there's actually a qu question from the audience that I, I wanted to, I was going to wait to ask this question to the end of the conversation, but since you said that, Yael, it makes me think, like, what, what is the message that you each take away from the film? Because I, uh, you know, Yael, you say it's an important message. I'm sure Maya thinks it's an important message. She made the film. Um, uh, what, what someone asked, what, what do you hope a viewer takes away from watching this film? I think you guys can both, get, all three can answer that. I'm going to let Maya yeah. answer that one. Um, you know, I had this moment um, when we filmed in Christians United for Israel uh, in, the, in, the sum, in the summit. And it was, it was quite in the beginning, you know, I was, it, I haven't met many evangelicals before we filmed there. So it was, every conversation was really eye-opening for me. And and I had this chance, opportunity to speak with a few uh, young um, uh, volunteers that in this in this event, 
And, and I started this conversation with them and it was really after we saw this event when they sent, you know, the, they sent their people to advocate against um, the American aid. And I was telling them and saying them, listen guys, but like you're sitting here in Washington DC and you're pushing for something that our security community are not happy with it. And why you think you have like, like why you think you can do that? You know, when, when Americans hear that the Russians are involved in their <laughs> internal issues, they're very angry about it. Why do you think you can't be involved in my life? Like, why? You know, we're here, we're not only biblical people, we're just like actual people that have life here and we want to live in, in peace and, and we, want, we want to have a nice life and not to get killed. And it was amazing because this was this moment when they looked at me and say, we never thought about it. And, and, and I just really, really wanted to bring this and ask these questions and, and to reach to, to the widest audience that I can, Jewish and evangelical. And it was really important for me to, 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 to speak with the Christian evangelicals and, and actually, you know, to succeed, to have this conversation with them because I understand that for many of them, they know, you know, that, that it's this amazing thing when you start to explore this topic, you constantly hear, we love you. And, and it's a strange feeling when someone just tells you, I just love you. And you want to tell him, but you don't know me, like why you love me and, and, and what it actually means that you love me. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I was always saying that I'm making a film about love. Um, so, so for, for myself, I just wanted that, that these, that also the Jewish community and the Christian evangelical community and the Israel and the Israeli people will look at that and have an opportunity to actually look in, in depth into this, into this topic, because I think it's really known kind of really in the surface, not, not, not for real. And to question themselves these questions that, that I asked myself. And yes, I do think that we're a, a sovereign country and, and, and we should, you know, kind of decide for ourselves what we want and how we want to, to have our future and not to have these external powers that creating this unba unbalancing the, the, the balance of democracy that Yael talk, talks about it, it's true, we, we have a democracy, but when you have this huge, huge power of Christian evangelicals, it's kind of changed the, the, the balance within our democracy. So that, that was my kind of big vision of this question. Can I say one thing? Is that all right? So specifically about the UNRWA um, uh, example that, that Maya gives and that's in the film, I think that's something that's also important to remember because it's a great example is there are some things that only affect Israel and there are some things that really affect American foreign policy as well. So UNRWA, President Trump's one of his main things, and again, I'm not a political expert and this isn't the area that I'm in, but talking just as a citizen as, and as an individual, um, there are a lot of problems with that department of the UN. For example, their textbooks talk about terror and praise terror. There are known terror attacks that were done from their facilities. It's the only UN body um, dealing with refugees that deals with one specific group, Palestinians. And we have so many different uh, refugees around the world that they have. That I think that that specific example, I think we also have to give credibility to the fact that evangelicals who are taking a political standpoint, it's not all based on Israel. These are people who also love America, have their position on other things as well regarding what they think the American government should do. And it could definitely and should be debated, but not, I, I don't think it's so clear cut that everything that evangelical Christians ask and you know want the American government to do relating to Israel is simply because of Israel and this prophetic notion. There are legitimate problems that have been pointed out by many scholars, by many politicians on every side with UNRWA, and this is American taxpaying money, that I don't think it's necessarily directly connected to this is, this is what we want in Israel because of biblical or because it's good for Israel and Israel saying no. I think that these evangelical Christians, however we group them together, tens of millions of them, 
also have their own position. They have their own thoughts. They have the, their own intellectual uh, system of getting to what they want and think is best for American tax dollars and, and policy that I don't think it's as um, simple as what's best for Israel, what's, um, what does Israel want, and what's prophetic. I think there are a lot of national American considerations that go into it as well. For example, Israel being the greatest ally America has in the Middle East. Um, that comes into play. It's not only Israel the biblical. These are very, um, these are people who love America just like they love Israel. So I just wanted to point that out as well when we're having that, that conversation. But it does seem it does seem hard to separate. I'm just wondering if if you I, I, yeah if you all comment. It does seem hard to separate the the evangelicals who have political power from the fact that they're evangelicals who do seem to you know uh, espouse you know uh, end times prophecy and and that being I mean one of the advisors says explicitly that he does see uh, politics through a lens of of biblical prophecy. So I. I it's interesting because it what you said, Yao, makes so much sense to me, and yet there are also evangelicals who are doing things because of the evangelical cause. So I, it's it's very complicated to me. I don't, I, um, but yeah, yeah. Well, I think seeing the lens through biblical prophecy also could mean after the fact, looking back at situations, not necessarily looking at the words of the Bible and feeling a personal and. A, a personal mission to have to push politically to bring those words to fruition. A lot of times I see history through biblical eyes as well. I mean, I come from 11 generations in Jerusalem and uh, my father was the first generation born outside of Jerusalem. And I came back to Israel and have four children born here that I look through these things also as a Jewish person through as Maya and Abi know, cause it's the way I interpret everything is through prophetic and spiritual eyes. So I think there, there um, isn't something by definition wrong with, um, with looking at the world through spiritual eyes. I think it gives a lot of hope, a lot of comfort, but to create policies based on simply those um, exact understanding of biblical words and believing that it's not what's in the best interest of any country, I don't agree with. Um, okay, um, so we have some more questions from the audience uh, I thought we could get in. Um, for the filmmakers, someone asked, uh, I'll kind of boil it down, but when you're in situations with people who maybe don't share your views, right, were there any times where you felt um, uncomfortable or, um, I mean, yeah, unwelcome? I mean, it's funny because you, you, you know, uh, in Kentucky, for instance, you, it seems like you have a somewhat playful relationship with them um, uh, while it's a little bit antagonistic, but never to the point of threatening. But the question was, you know, how did you deal with that? Uh, A.B., you, you take it. I think, um, and this goes actually to the question that you asked earlier about the message of the film. Um, you know, there are many ways to tackle the issue of evangelical Jewish relations. And because it sits on so many questions, whether it's about the boundaries of church, church and state, whether it has to do with uh, the growing power of religion in Western democracies, it has to do with theological paradoxes. There are many, many issues that could be tackled. But I think one of the important things that this was key from the moment we started and until the, you know, where we're now, where people are watching the movie, was that um, we wanted to give a human face or human faces to issues that otherwise are blank political statements. And people can view their own opinion. Yael just stated and articulated her, um, what she believes in. And someone might see that and think, oh, this is dangerous to America. And someone might see it and say, this is exactly the direction as God sees it that Israel and America should go forward with. That in and of itself is a value and is a message. And I think, again, two weeks before the elections, people who live in places like New York or Los Angeles and have never set foot in Kentucky need to have uh, uh, an image of why decisions are being made. It's not because people are uninformed. It is because this is what people really believe in. Now, to answer your current question, what did it feel like in Kentucky? That value that we were, I see both of you smiling in and my, um, 
I was also a producer and cinematographer of the film. So often, you know, Maya and I were in very, very intimate situations with all the characters. And the moment um, both the cameras were on and when we shut them off, I think there is something, uh, I think the word is intimate, again, as a goal was really to understand what makes these pe people tick. And, um, you know, whether an audience member, as I said, will think that this is fundamentalism and dangerous or whether they will think that it is wonderful. We wanted to get as close as possible and bring that picture back for, for viewers. The second thing, just the final thing to say is that we were also Israelis going to rural Kentucky um, where people had Israeli flags and a giant star of David in their church. And yet they had never met an Israeli or, or met, many of them had never met an, a Jew, let alone an Israeli who had, who had made that effort to come there. And I think that it created really, really fascinating um, interactions, questions. And I think the curiosity was very, very genuine. And it came from both sides, both from us as filmmakers and from them getting an opportunity to, to learn more about Israel and where we come from. So it was fascinating when the camera was on and when it was off, the elephants are there in the room, um, but they're just part of that relationship. Maya, anything to add? Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to say that, that for myself, and this is the second film that I'm going kind of to say to the other side, right? I'm not filming um, my community. I'm not filming my, you know, the, the, the people that's that around me. And and yeah, I and for myself, it's constantly being the other in the situation. And again, as an as an immigrant, I think it may be something that I really get used to. <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm the other since I'm 10, <laughs> when I came to Israel from Russia. Um, and, but also for me, and, and I think it's really good for your, you as a filmmaker uh, um, to be not connected. I will just give you a small example, which I'm sure that all our American audience will understand what I'm talking about. So for example, Boyd and all the people in, in Kentucky, they have quite a heavy uh, Southern accent. And for myself, I can hear that they have an accent, but they have zero uh, opinion on it. I, you know, I don't put in them in any box just because I don't know these boxes. You know, I'm I'm, I'm living in other boxes, <laughs> and and on the other hand, they cannot put me in any box. So I think that's a fair uh, uh, conversation when both sides are not putting each other into a box and then then they can start as a clean table you know clean page and 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 actually be as a human beings and and actually be you know and and on that to start and 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 create this uh, this re this relationship and i think from my for myself it was the same with the l you know i People many times asking me also about Forever Pure and with this one, how you could go and film these people? And I'm and like, don't you hate them? And I'm saying, first of all, you don't want to spend three years of your life with someone that you hate. And that's what you do when you're making a film, you, you're spending your years of your life with these people. So it's better for you that you won't hate them because that sounds like a nightmare to me. <laughs> and and I just, as a person, I, I don't hate people, not for their views and not for, I, I just allow, I hope that I'm allowing them to, 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 to tell them, to tell me themselves. Um, and I hope that I, that I succeed to see them. You know, I, I, I remember that and one of Yael, and you know, we had conversations and Yael, she's a very smart woman and she understands exactly that I'm not uh, coming to make an infomercial about the fellowship. And, and, and I totally understand that that was a matter of concern for her through these years, what will come out of this, you know? And, and, and I understand it and I think it's very difficult and I actually really appreciate that she was brave enough to let us to do this because I think like, yeah, it, it's a big thing. And, and we're really, really close with her in, in many very personal situations. Um, and I remember she asked me a very smart question. She asked me, what do you want me to think uh, when I will watch the film? And I answered her, I want you to feel that I saw you. 
Um, and that's the thing, you know, I'm trying to see these people and, and then, then when they will watch the film, they will say, oh yeah, that's me. Like they won't say, who's this person that on the screen? And once you succeed in that your characters, and yet I'm sorry I'm calling you a character, but you, <laughs> you are. <laughs> but, 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 but when your characters are actually watching the film and, and, and seeing a reflection that they recognize, then they will come out of the film and say, yeah, it's fine. Maybe I'm not agree with everything, but that's actually me out there. It was a long answer for a short question. Yeah. Um, I, I could keep asking lots of questions. Um, but, um, OK. Uh, all right, I, I do have a question, one more question, and then one more last question from the audience, and then we can stop. Um, I. Um, uh, Maya, about your saying about the you know the characters and about about understanding the people, um, uh, you know I I like Boyd, uh, uh, you know I, I and and I can see why you chose to talk to him, um, and I I was very touched by the uh, Lutheran Palestinian uh, pastor as well, um, 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 and and Yael's story as well, and I'm I guess. Um, um, I'm wondering um, why, so question for Maya and, and Abby and, and question for Yale. So um, why did you think it was important to include the, the voice of, uh, of, him, of, the, of the Lutheran pastor and, and that conversation with Boyd? And I'm curious, Yael, what you, what you took from him. Uh, I can't imagine you were expecting to meet uh, a Palestinian Lutheran pastor in the film. So um, yeah, that's my question. So, so I think, you know, I first of all, I'm really happy that you like Boyd, and and that was really my goal. Uh, I wanted people to like him. I wanted people from New York that will usually, you know, he will represent for them everything that they hate. They will find themselves at some point at the film center. So, oh, I actually like him. That's like for me. That was I like to messing with my audiences heads you know that that's exactly the complexity that i'm interested in um, um and you know and boyd for, and for me i think one of the processes sometimes is that you go in with your characters and you really uh, love them and 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 sometimes you hope that you know that they will be that they will do something that you will say, yes, like that, that happened. And for me, the fact, you know, Boyd really suffered in his life. He almost died in the age of 21. And I think this really, it really allows him to, to, has, to have such a huge, big heart. And, and I, we saw what he, and we filmed what he does, you know, in the community for the kid, that for the unfortunate kids and how he helps them. And for me, I really wanted that, you know, and, and, and really wanted to see how would be his reaction uh, um, to Palestinians. Because, you know, and, and not by accident, of course, you know, he goes to, to, to Bethlehem and he says there, what was the, the greatest commandment? Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus taught us to love. And then he goes there and he just don't see it. And I, he really broke my heart <laughs> in this scene. That's the truth. Like, I was really hoping that at that moment, he will succeed to see beyond the politics. And, and as, my, as the script writer Mark Monroe said, Maya, people are changed. <laughs> people get changed only in Hollywood films. They never change in documentaries. <laughs> yeah, because, because usually people not get, getting changed, you know? And, and, so for me, that was, I really wanted him to sit there, you know, and, and, and I understand the, the differences between the Lutheran pastor and, and the evangelical, I totally get it. But the bottom line is that there's two pastors, young, smart uh, people sitting in front of each other. And one of them is just don't see uh, how wrong the situation that the other is into it and you know and, and 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 in a way that's what we see it's a kind of politicization of the religion you know when we love someone 
but we love someone that is going together with our political views and that's like something that is very very wrong for me because and 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 i really was kind of sure and again i need to be sometimes naive otherwise you can't uh, do this stuff I, I really thought that he will that he will you know be express um understanding or, or something to him so for me this is one of the most amazing things in in the film because you just yeah you see everything there the indoctrination that like and 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 in a way how sometimes people just can't see what they what happens in front of their eyes because of of their being educated and indoctrinated in a certain uh, worldview Uh, Niall, did you, do you oh. feel that way? <laughs> no. Sorry, I'm. Uh, do, you, do you want me to ask? Go ahead, y'all, and then we'll go to. Uh, I, I look at it very different. And I think the starting point comes from your personal position and the eyes that you see the conflict from. That Maya was hoping that ultimately, because she loves Boyd, that he would come to see it through her eyes, which I totally get. That's how we all are, that we see something in a certain way. And we want people we love and respect to see it through our eyes because we all, and that's that's the whole defining, I think, characteristic of this conflict. We all think we're right and not just right, but that there's so much complexities to it. And so when I saw that part it was very interesting to me as well. And, and my first thought was, oh my gosh, Maya's a genius. <laughs> and then she brought him to meet it. I loved it. But what, what that part was so powerful to me was actually, it's, it's funny, I, I was smiling when Maya was talking because I took the polar opposite out of it. What I took was, you could love somebody without agreeing with them. You could love someone and have a heart for their suffering without saying this is the cause of their suffering. What I took from it was that Boyd is actually so much more educated in the history that's very complex of when Israel was in Bethlehem versus when Israel wasn't in Bethlehem, how many Christians there were pre-1948, how many Christians there were in 1967, how the level of Christians has been, wow, going down so dramatically by tens of percentages, sometimes every 10 years. Um, and, and so I think the question goes back to whose responsibility is that? And that's what all of the politics in this region go back to. Are the Christians in Bethlehem dwindling and leaving because of, as the pastor there simply said, the Israeli oppression? Or is it, or is it not? Or is it because they're not treated being truly? I'm just raising questions, but that sh to show that the fact that somebody's suffering, I always say, for example, about Gaza, I always say the people, the Palestinians in Gaza are suffering. Yes, I have a heart for them. I love them. I hope that they have food and I hope that they have a good life and I hope that they have freedom. But the question doesn't go back to, do I love them? Do I believe in that? And it comes down to whose responsibility is it and what's stopping that? And in my eyes, what I say is free Gaza from Hamas. Um, and so I think that's where the complexity comes in. The same situation, a similar situation when Pastor Boyd met the pastor in Bethlehem, that he was an amazing man who was very articulate and very sweet. And I connected to him and I felt for him and I loved him. And the question goes down to, are Christians in Bethlehem suffering? Yes, nobody's going to say that they're not. How do we fix that? And that's where the problem comes in. Um, there's no clear answer. And what I took from it was Boyd does know the situation. He does have his opinions and they're very strong. And I like to see that they weren't just gonna be changed based on an emotion, but that he has very concrete, both religious and political. You see on his desk at one point that he's reading all about the war of 1967. He's reading about, I mean, this isn't, even, even though he has the accent that it's easy to stereotype him, like Maya said, this isn't an idiot that you're talking about. He's very educated. He's very, he knows Israel, the history and the people and the leaders that it actually made me see how, how strong he was in his knowledge and his belief, both spiritual, but also political, that he wasn't swayed from his whole world view by meeting somebody face to face. Uh, Abby, yeah. So first of all, Anthony, it was great to see you smiling earlier when the two of them were speaking. And again, I think, um, you know, that is exactly the kind of, thing that, that, that we're hoping for is that someone like Pastor Boyd will, you know, create empathy 
and yet a very rich and profound conversation with people who believe very, very different things. Um, I think that I wanted to just to, to speak to the Palestinian pastor, which is to say that there's another elephant who is not in the room, uh, and that is the Palestinian elephant. In other words, that the film, any film that you do about uh, uh, Israel and the Palestinians, and yet you don't have, you know, it's like the start of a joke, a Jew, a Christian, and a Muslim, you know, try to make peace or not, or there's no Muslim representation in the film. And the reason that that is, is again, it was very important to Maya starting out on this process that the film would be told through the people in this relationship. And again, people could love it, hate it, think, think it's dangerous or not, but that it would be told through people like Yale and Pastor Boyd and not adding a third element who would say, oh, they're all crazy, they're bad for me. That being said, it was very, very important to us to, to include a Palestinian voice. I think any film about Israel um, and America specifically had to morally, it, they are part of the story, a key part of the story. And the question was how to do that in such a way that would still keep this framework of, as Maya said, telling the story from the other side. So um, the person that we met was uh, this Palestinian pastor who is both Christian, goes to a Lutheran evangelical church in Bethlehem, and in that sense belongs still to this world. I think the conversation that Boyd has with the Palestinian pastor could not have happened if Boyd was speaking to an imam for that matter, because I think Boyd would not have entered that conversation, the imam certainly as well. Here, the, the paradox gets twisted one level deeper when you have two pastors who clearly share the belief in the same Jesus. And the question is, where do they share things in common? And where will politics actually take religion and tear them apart? Okay, we have to wrap up. Um, but um, like I said, I could talk about this all day. Uh, last question, someone from the audience asked, why did you choose to end the film with such a controversial quote, Maya, from the pastor? And it's, it seems as, you know, obviously it's directed at you, but then it's also directed at, at your audience. Um, well, I, I think that's how you should finish films. <laughs> Great, we're done. You are. <laughs> no, really, like you, <laughs> like imagine yourself. I would start with it. Where you can go after that? <laughs> no, I think I think it was it was a very honest moment um, by uh, by uh, Pastor uh, uh, by Pastor Bingham that that I thought that he gave us kind of a glimpse, you know, into this. Again, into this, there's con as you we started with an elephant, we'll end up with an elephant. So I think there's this elephant that constantly people are walking around it in 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 so many levels. It's like so many elephants that people are saying, yeah, just let's not go there or let's not. And there, it was this moment when he was again honest enough to just look into into the elephant's eyes and say, just. That's the elephant, you know. So, so, so and again, I, I really appreciate uh, honest honesty, and I appreciate when the characters are honest because I think, you know, that's why we're, that's why we do what we do. We want people that actually share their actual beliefs, and 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 then people will watch it and think about it and take something from it. Maybe the totally opposite of what I said here, or. Maybe they will agree with me. It doesn't matter, but at least it will create some thinking. So, uh, on the filmmaking level, of course, I want to finish on the like on the highest on the highest point. Uh, but also, there, I think this it's a very important moment uh, when this when you get in this kind of glimpse into this in, into the elephant's eyes. I hope I I didn't ruin totally the, all the elephant image by using it too much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I started, I said it too many times too. Um, We're gonna get messages from the SPCA. But, um, <laughs> so, um, uh, but what elephants? Were all yeah. elephants created fairly in the making of this film? Um, thank you, Maya. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Al, for taking the time to join us. Um, really appreciate. Um, thank you. Having, yeah, thanks so much. Nice to see you all and stay safe in Israel. Bye-bye, stay, stay safe, safe in Chicago and have a wonderful festival.
Thank you so much. Nice to see you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.